invite you this morning, if you have a copy of God's Word with you, let's turn to Zechariah, near the end of the Old Testament. Chapter 9, we'll start in verse 9. Zechariah 9 and 9. The story was told once about a man who passed away and, and went to heaven. And when he got up there, he was just totally taken aback by the splendor and the grandeur of heaven. As some people have said, it was St. Peter that met him there right at the gate of heaven, almost as if he was going to give him a tour. And as the man is looking around, he said to himself, wondering about the value system of heaven, he looked at St. Peter and he said, St. Peter, how, how much is a minute worth here in heaven? And Peter said, well, a minute up here is worth a million years. He said, wow. Well, St. Peter, how, how much is a nickel worth here in heaven? Peter looked at him and said, well, a nickel is worth a million dollars. He said, whoa, now, can I have a nickel? He said, you're going to have to wait a minute. Thank you, Cody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> I was a dying a slow death up here. <laughs> I'm going to be very thankful for you, Cody. <laughs> I'll not tell it again. Okay. We think about value system and we think about how we place worth and value on certain things and certainly certain people. Uh, and, and we gauge that in a number of different ways. And sometimes we do the same thing with people that we know and that we see. Uh, with worth and value comes also great expectation. And we move today to this event that we refer to in Scripture or is referred to in Scripture as the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to end up today in Luke 19, but we're going to start in Zechariah chapter 9 because some people will ask themselves the question or ask others, why did this have to take place as it did? What was the purpose of it? Well, there is a purpose in it. We'll talk about that when we get there in just a moment. But the answer to the question, why did it happen, is actually quite easy to uh, ascertain. It was because it was foretold in the Old Testament in Zechariah chapter 9. Clearly foretold in very vivid detail. So when we get to Zechariah chapter 9, let me go ahead and read these two verses. Then we'll make our way toward New Testament. And that's where we'll probably reside for a while until the Lord allows us to draw things to a close. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. See between these two verses if you can draw a distinction between time. Verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Father in heaven, thank you for your word once again. Thank you for this time and Holy Spirit. We just ask that you speak with clarity and authority, Father, in order that we can be challenged to change more into the likeness of your precious Son. We thank you once again for the work of the cross and the hope of the empty tomb. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, Palm Sunday, triumphal entry, foretold by prophecy in the Old Testament. When we look here in Zechariah 9, 9, 
this first verse here is very specific to some things as to why Jesus came the first time. That is what the triumphal entry is introducing for us. It says here, the King, capital K, King Jesus, is coming. Now, some people will look at this and they'll say, okay, this is actually a foretelling of sorts. It is a foreshadowing of when Jesus Christ will come and he will one day sit on a throne and rule and reign. Yes, he will. But we cannot discount or discredit the fact that Jesus Christ, when he came the first time, as this is a formal introduction of sorts, that Christ still came as a king. Here we see this very, very specifically laid out for us. He says, he's coming to you. That is important to note. Those people who lined the streets of the city of Jerusalem, who would laud him as king, he was coming for them. He came for those who came before, and he certainly came for those who would come after, of which we are very thankful that he came. It tells us here in verse 9 in Zechariah why he came. It says here, he is just and he has what? Salvation. He also says he's lowly. He's riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. If we went to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew discloses for us a detail that's not found in the other three Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are considered congruent or synoptic. John's Gospel, a bit of a different perspective. Matthew says that when the disciples went in Jerusalem and they got the colt upon which Jesus would ride, they also brought the mother of that colt with it. There were two rather than one. Jesus would ride on the young one. But here we see something as to why Jesus came this time. He will be lauded as a king when he enters into the city of Jerusalem. This would be why Jesus came the first time for the express purpose that he would go to a cross, die, and in doing so, he would pay for our sins. Interesting that Eastern, I'll say this, Middle Eastern monarchy, kings, when they rode to war, they rode on a horse. If they rode proclaiming peace, they rode on a donkey. We would see this laid out for us in the life of Solomon, also in the book of Judges, as well as in the book of 2 Samuel. These things would be laid out for us here. So between verses 9 and 10, there is a bit of a distinction. Because in verse 10, we're moving from the first advent of Jesus, when he came down from heaven to earth, was born here as a babe, in the most lowly and meager of means, laid in a feeding trough for animals. And when he comes the second time out of heaven, of which he will be leading us as his children in procession, we're going to see what's going to be laid out for us here in verse 10 of Zechariah 9. It says here, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse, the battle bow, and I'm going to speak peace. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As far as the elimination of God's enemy and the enemies of God's people, that won't take place until Christ is ruling on a throne in the millennial reign. We have both epics of time laid out for us here in Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10. Today we'd like to focus on the ninth verse because look at the value system for just a moment. And let's think about the people who were lauding Jesus Christ as king and remember what they were saying to him as he entered. And also, an interesting emotion was evoked from Jesus when he was approaching the city. And only Luke, the gospel writer, discloses this. And it only happened one other time that we had it recorded in Scripture in the ministry of Jesus. So now let's move to New Testament and let's make our way to Luke 19, okay? Luke 19, and when you find Luke 19, we'll start in verse 28. 
we'll see where the Lord may have us go from there. If we wanted to entitle this message today, God's message, it might be this. Tears amid the triumph. Tears amid the triumph. Luke 19, verse 28. When he, Jesus, had said this, now what he had just said, Lord willing, we're going to go back and read what he just said. I think it's important, and it provides quite a context as to why things were happening the way they were. When he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem geographically is a city up on a hill, okay? They're on the Jericho Road. They're heading up toward Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and to Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, the Mount of Olives. It is said that when Jesus Christ comes out of heaven to establish his millennial reign, when he comes out of heaven, his feet are said to hit on the Mount of Olives. And there he will make his way into the temple area, into the city of Jerusalem. See if there's a bit of a parallel here as we go through the scriptures. It says, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, verse 30, saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one had ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. This is an interesting passage of scripture. Some commentarians say this, that the plan to acquire these two donkeys had already been set in place. The reason being, and if this is possible, it's possible, is that for a Jewish man to be connected too tightly to the person of Jesus Christ right now, knowing the controversy attached to him, you could be excommunicated from the Jewish synagogue. So they were kind of, if you want to put it that way, possibly keeping things on a bit of a down low to not stir up any further controversy because the religious leaders were already seeking to kill Jesus and anyone attached to him could find themselves in the same windfall. Verse 32, so those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the coat, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the coat? And they said, The Lord has need of it. Then they brought him to Jesus. They threw their own clothes on the coat, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Some people feel like that the clothes of those who were placed on the coat upon which Jesus would sit and also the clothes of those that might have been strewn along the side of the road that Jesus would proceed on toward the city of Jerusalem are a representation of the people whom Jesus had come to redeem when he would go to the cross. Beautiful thing to think about there. Verse 37. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. And they said, verse 38, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a statement from the Hallel, Psalm 118, verse 26. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Does that phrase of a verse there remind you of anything that you've heard at any other time in Scripture? Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Doesn't that sound much like the proclamation of the angels at the story that we read out of Luke chapter 2? Now, isn't that interesting? Verse 39. Some of the Pharisees called to Jesus from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, this is getting out of hand. Tell them to quiet down. And Jesus answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Verse 41, now as he drew near, he saw the city. And what was his reaction? What did he do? What other place in scripture do we know that that occurred? Outwardly like that. This is only the second time in scripture that Jesus outwardly wept. 
It was at the tomb of Lazarus. But this word here is strong. When Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus, there was a groaning inside of him. An outward weeping, but a groaning. This is almost the type of a mourning that someone would evoke over someone who had passed away. This is almost like sobbing, crying. This is a powerful word here, a powerful word. And look what Jesus said in verse 42. If you had known, even you, and he's talking about the people, I mean spiritually, he's talking toward the people generally in the masses. If you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Okay, there's that word. Peace in the heaven and glory in the highest. Back to verse 38. Now Jesus is talking about peace. The people are shouting and begging for peace. But there's a disconnect here. And it made Jesus cry. We find out one of the reasons why here in verse 43. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you, level to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Get this, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus deserved this adulation. He deserved this adoration. He deserved it. And he was their king. And Jesus knew what lay ahead for him. Jesus' plans did not change when he came down from heaven to earth and spent somewhere between 30 and 33 years here. It was in the mind and wisdom of God from eternity past that God would create human beings that he would love enough in order to provide a payment for the sin that they would commit, the world that they would be born into. We're born into a fallen world. And by our very thoughts and actions, it just bears out the fact that we're born with a sin nature and we need a rescue. And there's only one person that could accomplish that work and it was Jesus. So as Jesus is coming into town and people are cheering and there's clamor and to the religious establishment, it appears that, listen, they would make a statement, but just listen to the crowds. They have fallen head over heels for him. This is out of control. Jesus, could you quieten your group down? Jesus says, not that he couldn't. He just says, I won't. I will let them. But Jesus also knew that the cheering for the crowd and the applause, and listen to what they were saying, Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Son of David, they would exclaim toward him. They viewed Jesus as one who would come and rule and reign the nation like unto David. But the power of Jesus, the choice of words that he used, but the miraculous power and how that he could not be debated without coming out on the upper end of any type of a discussion like that. The people saw in him the hope of a rescuer, not from their sins, church, but from the oppression of the nation and the empire of Rome. They were under the thumb of Rome, and they wanted to be free. And they longed for Messiah, but they did not expect that Messiah would face a cross in his plans. And because the cross was in the plans of the Father for Jesus when he would come the first time, the folks soon who were clamoring to save us, save us, you are Messiah, you are our King, save us, because their hopes would be dashed only a few days later, they would then be calling for his crucifixion. Can people be that fickle? 
Can people's opinions change and turn? Yes, they certainly can. Now, Jesus is allowing this public acclamation of him because it's appropriate for him to do so. But he also knows how superficial this is. And it works him up to weeping when he begins to look over the city. And he understands the time of my visitation and the reason for which I came for the first time has been hidden now from you. Because not only have you outwardly rejected me, you have also called for me to be killed. And because you have rejected me, there are some things that are going to happen to you that they weren't aware of at the time, but it would be cataclysmic, chaotic, destructive. Not long after this, 35, 40 years maybe, Titus, the Roman general, would come in around the city of Jerusalem and somewhere, I think, in the spring, and I think I read it was around the month of April, he would start to lay siege around the city of Jerusalem. Essentially, what he would do was he would cut off people either coming in or leaving. And he wasn't going to allow anything to come in. No food. Difficult to get water. You can weaken a population by starving them from food and socialization. And having weakened them for a number of months, Sometime in the fall of that, of that year of our calendar, September maybe, then the Roman army would come through the city of Jerusalem in the year AD 70 and level it to its base. It's described like this. Not one stone would be left on top of another. Women, men, children, slaughtered, and the ones who might have survived the destruction would be placed in slavery. It would be a time like the city of Jerusalem had never encountered. Jesus said, this is what will take place because you have rejected Messiah. And for what I came to do this first time. To laud him as king? Absolutely. But Jeff, you're saying that he didn't come to be a king on a throne yet. So why then? Church, examine this for what's going to happen. Think about this for just a moment. If a Roman general went to war, and if it could be attributed to him, attributed to him, that he had killed 5,000 people in battle or more, that Roman general could be brought back to the city of Rome and lauded almost like a king. They would call it a triumph. They would bring him in with procession, a parade. He would be in a chariot, maybe a golden one. He would be in a parade with the people whom he might have taken prisoner and some of the spoil of war. And they would laud his victory if he had killed 5,000 or more. That's the Roman triumph. Well, what does that have to do with Jesus? If we were to turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 41, we're going to see what happened on the day of Pentecost. The Bible tells us that on that day, based on preaching and the power of the Holy Spirit, tongues of fire, that 3,000 people gave their heart to the Lord that day, became believers, Christ followers. Well, that's 3,000. Well, if you move on over a couple of chapters to chapter 4 of Acts, verse 4, we're going to find out that due to the preaching of the disciples of Peter at that particular time, an additional 2,000 people were added to the 3,000. So what do we have? 5,000 who, under the convicting, convincing power of the Holy Spirit, had been released from their sin the grip of it, and the penalty of it. So to laud Jesus Christ as a king, as he is entering the city of Jerusalem on his way to a cross, is totally appropriate. 
because Jesus Christ was going to war for us on that cross. The sting of death would be removed because Jesus would take the demand of the law with him. No longer would we be held accountable to a standard that we couldn't keep, and that's perfection because that's what the law demands. The sting of death being sin and the strength of sin being the law, all those things were conquered. Death, hell, grave, all conquered through the conquering work of Jesus Christ when he went to the cross. That's what awaited him after his triumphal entry. We have every right and every reason to be a part of that crowd lauding him as our king based on what he was about to do there. That's who Jesus was. They missed him in his coming and for the reason why he came that particular time. Let's back up for just a moment as we start to draw things to a close. This is a fascinating passage of scripture to me, given the context and where things were going. Triumphal entry, Jesus riding on a donkey, colt. Uh, listen, that's, that gives us another reason to fully understand Jesus' control over creation. Because you, you don't just hop up on a young animal that hadn't been ridden before. That could be an exciting first seven or eight seconds. We don't read about that here. Jesus in control of everything. Even when Jesus went to the cross in full control of his faculties. Even when it looked like they were in control of him. Jesus had a poise about him that was incredible. Hard to imagine. But before Jesus entered the city, let's go back to Luke 19 and let's look at verse 11. And let's look at what Jesus says. And this is kind of where this lands with us today. There were tears on the part of Jesus in the midst of the triumph. But here's a message for us today that maybe we can be a part of relieving the uneasy tears that others may shed because they're just not quite sure where this is all going to end up for them one day and they could be wrestling or struggling with who Jesus Christ is and what he desires to do for them. Verse 11, Luke 19. Now as they heard these things, now listen, this is just right after the encounter with Zacchaeus. Jesus spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Now listen, when the people are thinking kingdom of God, they're thinking king and overthrowing Rome. Okay? Jesus says this, Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And this mina here is an amount of money that's quite remarkable. I believe it was worth almost or right at or maybe a little more than three months' wages. This particular man in this story, okay, he had ten servants and he had ten minas and he gave one to each of his servants. Now, let me stop here for just a moment. These are what some of the things that I just am, I marvel at Jesus when he tells a story. A parable has been defined like this. We may have done it from here before. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And when Jesus is telling this parable here, and he lays this out in verses 12, 13, and 14, there's every reason here to think that the folks who heard this parable might be able to step back and ask themselves the question, haven't we heard this or seen this play out before? Jesus would take symbols, earthly symbols that people were very familiar with, and he would put this story together that had a deeper spiritual meaning. Here, he's delving into the politics of the day to tell a story that applies to him. Herod the Great was the one who was alive when Jesus was born. He was the one that was responsible for the death of all those male babies ages two and younger. When he passed away, one of his sons by the name of Archelaus 
stepped up to take over rule over that particular area. He was totally incompetent. He was a despot. He was ruthless. Rome hated him. The people hated him. And it wasn't long before he was going to be deposed from that, and they were going to start rotating Roman procurators through that area just to kind of keep an eye on that particular part of the country where Rome was over. The fifth procurator in line to watch over that particular area was a man by the name of Pontius Pilate. We've all heard of him, especially around this time of year. But they said at this particular time that if you were in an area that was subject to Rome, if you were going to be a king that Rome would appoint, again, under their thumb, but to rule, you had to go to Rome in order to receive the authority officially from Rome. It is said that Archelaus, when he was receiving his kingdom authority, went to Rome to receive it. He was so little thought of there that some people have speculated that Rome gave him the authority. They just refused to refer to him as a king. But the Jews were so insistent on not being under his thumb, they sent a delegation of Jews to Rome to protest. We will not be under the reign of this man. Caesar Augustus listened to their complaints, but he didn't really do anything about it. And then he sent him on back, and later he would be replaced. Now Jesus is telling this story, and he says here in verse 12, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And again, he called these servants together. In verse 14, but his citizens hated him and said, we're not going to have this man to reign over us. I've got to believe that some of the folk who heard Jesus tell this were thinking to themselves, this story sounds familiar. Do you know who Jesus is referring to here when he's telling the story about the nobleman that went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return? Jesus is telling the story about him. Jesus came down from heaven to earth, from the top to the bottom, in order that we would have an opportunity to rise from the bottom to the top. And one day before Jesus Christ comes back down to earth to set up a kingdom, he is going to come and meet us intermediary, the rapture, and we're all going to be called to meet him in the clouds and proceed on into heaven for him. And about seven years later, we're all going to come down here. But after Jesus goes to the cross and gives his life and he raises from the dead and he lives here for about 40 more years, 40 more days, then he's going to ascend back into heaven. And around that time, he will then formally receive the kingdom by which he so rightly has earned while he's been here. He came down here and died for us and we ascends into heaven, he'll be formally granted the kingdom. And then at some point in time, that right now only Father God knows, he'll be alerted to step out into the clouds, we'll all come to meet him, and after that, seven years after that, we're all coming down here, and then he will formally receive the kingdom and rule. Jesus is going through this parable here of the minus. And he's talking about that when this particular nobleman came back, one of them was very faithful with what he had given him. He said in verse 16 that he had earned 10. The nobleman said, you've done a great thing. I'm going to turn over to you 10 cities. The second one said, I've earned five. He said, I'm going to give you five cities. There's another one here that said, I took the one mina that you gave me. I put it in a handkerchief and I kind of hit it. And he was very, very upset with him over that. And then he goes on down there in verse 24 and he said, and he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has 10. But they said to him, master, he's already got 10. For I say to you that to everyone that has been, that will be given and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Verse 27 Bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. This is pretty stout and it's pretty strict. And what Jesus is trying to tell us here, listen, this is not the parable of the talents 
that we read about in the Olivet Discourse. I believe that's in Matthew, where Jesus is talking about each one will be given according to their own ability to be able to serve. This particular parable is about the day of opportunity and God's people, people in general, had an opportunity when Jesus Christ was right there and they rejected him. They had him killed. And Jesus here is telling them this story that for those who reject, they'll be destroyed in one day if they live their entire life in rejection of the call of Holy Spirit on their life. They rejected Jesus then in first person. But about a week, week and a half after Jesus ascended, Jesus came back in the form of Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And he's here convincing and convicting people of their lost condition. And if a person goes through their entire life in rejection of the Holy Spirit's call, do you know what that does to the Holy Spirit, Jesus? He grieves. When God, who has given all, and knows and wants to give us our best, and we say no because we think we have a better way. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. May it not be said of us as God's children who already know him that when he's leading us to witness or to be involved in service that we think we know a better way. But there are lost people out there looking and searching for truth and answers and meaning and purpose in life. And they'll try everything in this world trying to fill that gap and that void. But only Christ. To these people, Jesus said they had me. They missed it. They missed me and why I've come. And because of that, their eyes are now blinded. And in just a few years, certainly sooner than any of them could imagine, Rome will come and destroy it. What a picture of what will happen one day at Great White Rome, Lake of Fire Judgment, for those people who thought in their mind they knew a better way. So the question this morning is this for us. How can we be better prepared for the coming of our King? Because the next big event on the end times calendar is rapture. And church, let us be reminded there, there's really nothing left in prophetic fulfillment that needs to take place. It truly could happen at any time. Are we living in a state of preparedness? And just what might it be that God would desire for us to do to be an enlightenment to someone else if they don't know Christ? Remember, it's not God's desire that any perish. And when's the last time you thought about those whom you know who don't know Christ and you were so concerned about them that it moved you to tears? The sin in our life ought to move us much the same way. But people who are lost don't realize that they're, they're already dead. We have the words of eternal life if we know Jesus Christ personally. And we certainly hope that you do today. Think about where we are today and where these people were with Jesus and how excited to think our Messiah has arrived and Rome's days are numbered. Jesus said, it's not my came this time. But there will be a time. Let's do what we can to enlighten and help lead others to the fact that this life that we've been given is our opportunity. And what you do with the person of Jesus Christ is truly what makes all the difference. Only Him. May that be our motivation and our determination this day. Every day. Let me pray with you, okay? Father in heaven, we are thankful for you. We are thankful, Father, that your word is not just a collection of Bible stories. But Father, there's a directive here. There's a challenge here. There's a wake-up call 
here that time is passing for those who don't know you. I just pray, Father, that we will be willing to be able to go anywhere to reach out to anyone in any way at any time. Whatever you desire, Father, may we be found faithful. May we be found faithful. Father, for those who know you, we didn't miss who you are. There was a time in our life, Father, where we didn't know you, but Holy Spirit, you were patient with us to lead us to saving knowledge. Thank you, Father, for mercy and grace. Thank you for Palm Sunday, Father. Thank you for our King Jesus who went to the cross and fought a battle there that we could not imagine what it was like in the garden for him, the agony, the struggle. But Father, he won on our behalf. And if we turn to the end of your word, we can read where we win and we're so thankful. Father, have your way during this time, Father, during this time. If there's anything we need to do to do business with you, have your way. That's our prayer, Father, in Jesus' name just a minute or two. Heads remain bowed and eyes closed. If there's anything at all in your heart, give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to do His work.